afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Your presence is much appreciated. Um, welcome to the February, February Policy Jam on Safer Internet Day. And we'd be grateful if you could talk about this on Twitter and other social media uh, using the hashtag BCS Policy Jam to generate conversation and content on there. We'd love to see you talking about it and offering feedback. And to introduce myself, my name is Arnold Nyamande. I'm the policy manager here at BCS, and I'm one of your hosts at, of the Policy Jams alongside Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Aldridge, uh, Senior Policy Manager um, at BCS. Some of you uh, may know me, I've been here a few um, years now. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a new initiative for us. This is only the second one and the first one that we're going to be doing themed. So this is all around, as Arnolda said, um, Safe for Internet Day and the, um, the online safety bill. So uh, we've got some great speakers. Uh, we do indeed, and we'll get to them in a minute. Um, just for those of you who haven't been here before, just going to quickly go over the policy jams, what they are and why we're doing them. Um, so our goal is to open a new channel of communication with you that's happening in real time uh, regularly once every month. And what we're doing here is we're going to present with you, present you what we're working on, what is, you know, what are people talking about in the field at the moment, the most important topics, one of the most important topics that we think are relevant to our work. And we're going to open the floor to you. We're going to ask you to get involved and offer feedback and comment. And we do that every every month, every second Tuesday of the month. You'll find us here, same time, same day, uh, every month. The format is we'll spend about 15 minutes talking, presenting to you on what we're working on. And then we're going to open the floor. We want you to spend most of the time with you talking and us listening. Um, so it's very much uh, you may, you know you get you make the most of it is what I'm trying to say. Um, please do chat, use the chat box, put your hands up when the time is appropriate, and we'll get to you, and we can have hopefully a really good conversation. Um, so just to start with the latest news, I'm going to start on the right hand of the page. Uh, here you can see my mouse. Yes, you can, right? You can yes. <laughs> uh, so right here we're starting with BCS Community. BCS Community is a new platform that was launched last month and it's a place for you to come and talk and again engage and get involved in what we do. So we've been having some really, really interesting conversations on there. We've had conversations about the end of end-to-end -end encryption and we've talked about internet safety and we come to there and we ask for you to share your expertise with us we ask for you to share your insight with us so that anything that we produce anything that we put out is reflective of the values of our membership and of course the more of you are signed up the more our um, output is reflective of our, the views of our membership so please do go it's community.bcs.org and you can sign in using your my bcs credentials it's really simple and straightforward and there's a whole team of people there to help you if you need it but it's really really user friendly and accessible as well and linked to that beneath here we have a whole new page on the bcs website talking about how you can have influence and impact this is about how you can engage with us and how we engage with you it outlines all the channels of communication available to you. That is the community page, these policy jams, newsletter, email, all of it outlined in detail on this page. And it tells you how to get in touch with our teams. And as we said, we're, we're always open to your input. We're always seeking your input. So if you go onto that page on the BCS website, you'll find out more about how to get in touch. And then moving over to the left, we've got open consultations. Um, the top three are from central government and they are all due to close in April. Um, so our consultation process, how it works is we receive or um, see our consultation live on the government website. We read it, figure out what it's asking and we draft an initial response um, and answer that we think is appropriate to the work that the BCS does, the BCS mission. And then after that, we send it out for consultation to you, our members. We ask you to feedback, to edit, amend our content so that it's reflective of your reality as field professionals and it's reflective of your expertise because you know you will know you will know more than we do on some aspects aspects talking is hard today um, but we count on your expert knowledge essentially and we are in our consultation process we ask you to share that with us we ask you to fill in any gaps that we might have once you've done that you send it back to us we edit it and amalgamate it to make sure that it reflects everyone's response and it's that 
again, that everything that we do has to be reflective of your views because you are at the core of everything that we do. So we can only get the most out of this again if as many of you participate as possible. So please do keep an eye out on emails, uh, on community, all these channels highlighted over here. That's how we'll get in touch with you if we have any questions. And then currently we have a survey on end-to-end -end encryption. It's live, there's a link right here. If you, you get the slides after and you can click on it, go to the link, please do answer it. Please do share your opinions. Again, we really, really value your input. And then I'm going to move on to the next slide where I pass on to Dan. Hello. Um, yeah, so the, the, the meat of the, the day, I suppose, um, online safety bill. So I won't talk too much about it um, because there'll be uh, more conversation going on, but um, kind of just the things that we can see happening with it over the past couple of days are um, increased profile and increased pressure on the government, um, especially around a, a, a campaign by money saving expert Martin Lewis around trying to get um, online scams included in the scope of the bill. The government seems to be currently quite resistant to that for a number of reasons. Um, but we, yeah, so we're not sure whether that will, will move on, but we may have some insight from our um, expert panel in a bit. Um, according to my colleague, um, who I spoke to this morning over at uh, Demos, uh, fraud was named at the weekend as a priority legal offence. So, um, so there's potential for maybe some movement if, the, if there is pressure. And a government, the government also announced in their kind of... Um, the international uh, internet safety day uh, that websites hosting porn uh, mainly around are going to be forced you know forcing um websites to prevent underage access so there's some questions around um age verification practicalities and um the security of that um so that's really kind of where where we're at and where we think this is a um, where this is going to go, um, but we'll leave that till later. And I'll just try to go to the next slide. Um, this is a wordy slide, but it's it, the if I put in the, in the chat the link to the briefing, some of you may have already seen it. It was a briefing that we pulled together on the um, the white paper, the Leveling Up white paper. So um, the interesting I think thing I think for us was that it shifted stuff from the industrial strategy into this and it you know it wasn't it's a difficult one for, for us I think there is potential in it to um, to achieve a specific change in the areas that we want it to um, there are some structural uh, things that we quite liked around uh, public investment and research and uh, development outside of the southeast England uh, the southeast of England to make sure that um, there was more money being pushed into other areas um but there's no more money allocated uh, but if you're wanting to look at any more of what we had to say on that um, and specifically all of the really good stuff that bcs is um involved in um which uh you know people like john and andy um and hopefully vic uh, will will be able to to give give some insight on in a bit um because at the end of the day, BCS was established um, to make IT good for society. And in everything that we do, um, it's it, we have to have that at our heart. And uh, so hopefully levelling up is very much at the centre of that. So, uh, Thank you, Dan. And with that in mind, uh, I'd like to introduce you to this week's special guests. I'm just going to call on them in a minute to introduce themselves. And um, they are all experts in their field. They might, you know, play it humble but they know their stuff they know what they're talking about and they're really good authorities on this um so can I ask you one by one to tell us what you do and why do you care about this specific area of work and I'm going to start with Andy Fippin please hello everyone I'm Andy Fippin I am professor of digital rights at Bournemouth Uni um I have been involved with internet safety day since its inception um and have been doing work in this area for getting on for 20 years now um and I just it's a shocking sense of deja vu about most of um what's being talked about at the moment we seem to go in five-year cycles and um this seems to be the current one um I spend a lot of time talking to young people um about these sorts of issues and that doesn't necessarily align with what government are talking about at the moment thank you uh Vic 
Hi everyone, I am Victoria Baines. I am a visiting fellow at um, Andy's institution, Bournemouth University. I have a background in law enforcement, uh, working for CEOP, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre, but also Europol's European Cybercrime Centre. And I also worked for Facebook in Trust and Safety, so Law Enforcement and Intelligence Service Liaison. Uh, I'm now a researcher, drawing on my background in um, studies on rhetoric, and I have a particular interest in cybersecurity rhetoric, online safety rhetoric, and how we represent to quote unquote ordinary people um, online safety issues and cyber threats. So that's my particular perspective. Thank you. Uh, John? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name's uh, John Chippendall, and uh, I am the uh, Barefoot Director. Uh, so, Barefoot is a a uh, program within BCS that supports uh, teachers in primary schools to deliver uh, outstanding computing education to their pupils. Um, and I'm a teacher myself as well. So I am um, with BCS on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, but on a Thursday and Friday, I'm a teacher in a North uh, Manchester primary school teaching uh, science and computing, uh, mostly computing. And, uh, and why do I care on this? Well, I, you know, I, I work with those pupils in the school and I, and I want them to be able to thrive uh, in the digital world. And, and, and part of that is to be able to do that safely. So, yep, that's me looking forward to chatting. Amazing. Thank you. And this is the exciting part of the uh, policy jam where we open the floor to you and we ask you to get involved and we encourage you to get involved and you can do that by raising your hand so you come on and you verbalize your your question or you can put it in the chat box and while you do that we do have some uh, questions that have been pre-submitted that I'm going to present to our panel and the first one is what impact does internet safety day have on young people Oh, I kick off. Um, Why not, Andy? Go for it. <laughs> well, I'll go for it. Um, it's an interesting, like I said, I've been involved in these from, from the outset, and it, it seems to go through cycles of tons of stuff in the press, um, companies delivering all their CSR mission on this sort of thing, um, and then it going quiet again. I, I noticed there's very little about internet safety today on the BBC today. Um, I think where it works best is at a grassroots level. You know, I'm seeing UK Safer Internet Centre retweet loads of stuff about what schools are doing with young people on the ground. I, I sometimes worry that um, it's something which becomes just a, a way of sticking out press release and saying we care about the kiddies as well. Um, and I'm not sure whether um, it has much impact. So it's great to see the, the grassroots activity. Um, but I, I always remain a little cynical that about, oh, let's have a day to talk about this, whereas I'd, I'd rather it was an ongoing conversation, I think. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll jump in there as well, because um, I have a certain amount of involvement with the Council of Europe and, and looking at the legislation around um, online safety. And one of the requirements of the Lanzarote Convention uh, against child sexual exploitation is youth participation. So youth led activities, youth empowerment for me. And I think for the European Commission and all the EU institutions, Safer Internet Day is very much about children and young people leading these activities. So some of the best examples I've seen of this of where the kids themselves actually design the activities. And it may, may even be that they're educating their parents or educating an older relative or upskilling their teachers. That's what it should be about. My concern, and I think this is something that we've seen perhaps this year with the government's announcement on a, a recent yet another inclusion in the online safety bill and timing that for safer internet day my concern is that it gets a little bit hijacked for political and legislative purposes and and when we focus on that enforcement angle what we're really doing um, is we're continuing to scare the hell out of people and we're continuing to panic parents oh my goodness what they're exposed to adult pornography as well we should panic about that now we haven't even caught up with the other thing that we had to panic about in terms of online safety um so you know i would love to see more celebration of those youth empowerment aspects of safer internet day because that was its original intention and it would be nice to get it back there and and give children back the agency that they've already claimed i think thank you 
sorry, I was just going to to share an order if if I if I may, if I've got thirty seconds just on that one, um, because for me, obviously being in schools, it is safer internet day in my mind is very much about that um, pupil uh, work in in schools, and it, and and it is. Uh, important in you know for raising the profile of that subject it, uh, or area of the subject in school but just to um, echo what Andy said there uh, um, I think that uh, every day's safer internet day um, across the year it should be yes we get a boost uh, on that day with the, the the profile of that area of the curriculum but it, it's no substitute for a really broad well embedded curriculum around this stuff that's happening uh, throughout the rest of the year as well that's amazing thank you Andy um, and then kind of following up on your comment about how it can be an, an Every, it should be an everyday thing, it should be happening year round. What is the role of organizations like BCS and its membership in ensuring that we do deliver on that everyday safer internet day initiative? Can I come back in? I know, this <laughs> yeah. bit. Is that all right? Yeah, so um, obviously from, um, so Barefoot um, is obviously part of, you know, BCS, big part of the education program and offering into primary schools. and. You know, part of what we do is um, educating teachers, teacher professional development um, through workshops and then resources as well. So, you know, we're putting um, thought into the development of you know, high quality curriculum resources that can be used to educate the pupils in those schools and help them build strategies to assess the risks about going online and, and make informed judgments. So I think that's one way that we're, you know, that's certainly central to what I'm doing within BCS that's contributing to that. Thank you, John. Um, I was basically going to say, in terms of what can BCS members do, I think at a grassroots level, um, get involved in Barefoot. I'm a massive fan of Barefoot <laughs> and, and, and what they do. Um, and I think it's a great way for, for folk in the industry to actually sort of connect with teaching and, and young people on these issues. I also think one of the, the big gaps in online safety, for want of a better word, is we don't relate it to cybersecurity awareness and knowledge either. Um, there seem to be sort of two parallel lines that never cross. And, you know, I always come back to if you, if you protect your assets effectively and you don't see um, sharing your passwords as a good thing, then it's less likely your devices are going to be accessed and your internet materials are going to be um, accessed by other people. I think, you know, we, well, I'll, I'll get onto this in a minute, but the, the, the whole direction of national policy seems to be very much about making platforms do stuff rather than focusing on what education might do effectively. But I do think, you know, in terms of what members can do, bringing cybersecurity awareness to, to schools and, and colleges and things is, is really important. You know? Unless you choose a specialist computer science, GCSE or A-level pathway, it is unlikely you will have any cybersecurity education um, after the age of 13. Um, yet we then, you know, I work in the university sector, they were all sat around scratching their heads going, I thought all these students would know about this stuff. So, so yeah, on a, on a very practical level, get involved in Barefoot. Um, on a more policy level, I kind of like sit here scratching my head sometimes going, oh, here's another government minister who's decided that AI can solve this or platforms can do this. I think at some point there needs to be a bit of pushback from industry going, yes, we can do so much, but there are other stakeholders in safeguarding as well. And, and just waving your hand and going, well, you'll need to sort that out. I mean, age verification is one of my favourites. We're, we're in another age verification cycle at the moment. If it was easy to do, don't you think we'd have done it by now? From my perspective, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly endorse what Andy just said then. Um, you know, BCS members represent technical expertise in this area. Um, so you have a very strong policy position as individuals, actually, but certainly as a body, um, to be the sense check for some of the more ambitious representations of what technology can do. AI is absolutely that. You know, we have uh, the, the, the hype around what AI can do to protect children online is just absolutely massive. And there is, I'm going to nick your phrase, Andy, I do apologise because it's very much your phrase. There is a perception that there is a technological silver bullet to what are essentially societal problems, you know, uh, copyright, a fippin. Um, and, um, but, it, you know, and that applies as much to AI and the hype around that as it does to your very important poll on end-to-end -end encryption. You know, it, it's it's harder to deny 
if BCS members say, well, encryption is just maths, um, you know, it's harder to deny that than some of the privacy activists who have been unfairly labeled the screeching voice of the minority because they care about protecting people's data and communications. Um, but so there is a weight from that body of people who are technical experts explaining how technology actually works and managing expectations about what it can practically do. Thank you. Uh, I think we've got a few hands up. I don't know if you want to go to Andrew first and then Edward. Yes, uh, Andrew, I'm going to ask you to, un oh, you can, can you, hello, Andrew? Uh, yep, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Uh, fine. Uh, well, thank you, and uh, for, for for the uh, sort of comments, which is most interesting. And I have to say, as a sort of chair of the school governors, uh, I saw one of the comments or questions in the chat was about uh, how safer internet day reaches to schools, and be be useful to see an answer uh, to that if any of the panel have that. But but my uh, sort of comment was more: um, if I look at end to end encryption. Um, and how that's being implemented again in the context of schools um, uh, schools in the UK or certainly in England are required to have content filtering in place um, to uh, uh, shield uh, pupils from sort of, whether it's malware adult content or other age inappropriate uh, uh, content um, and some of the changes in the uh, uh, internet standards, um, which is sort of my field, um, are, will potentially bypass uh, content filtering. Um, uh, so for those of you that follow such things, um, that enc encrypted client hello and uh, encrypted DNS being sort of some of the relevant standards areas. Um, and I'm not sure uh, that at the moment that those, uh, you know, the, the impact of those changes is, is really taken seriously by the technical community. Um, so a lot of people promote the benefits of end-to-end -end encryption for privacy um, and completely disregard the negative uh, impact on privacy and safety uh, of uh, whether it's uh, sort of users of systems in schools or indeed victims of uh, child sex abuse, etc. Um, who, who are on the wrong side of uh, the, the, some of the harms caused by uh, uh, specific types of end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, so it'd be interesting to, to get any comments from, from the panel in, in terms of are, are you sort of following uh, uh, where uh, things like content filtering are being undermined by change standards and do you have a, uh, any views um, on, on how that can be uh, mitigated? Thank you. I'm just wondering whether myself or Vicky are going to dive in first. Shall, shall, I, shall I dive in? But yes, it's, it's um, particularly um, uh, encrypted DNS is something that has been on the, the filtering and monitoring radar for, for quite a while. Um, I'm, I struggle with this somewhat because I, I see a, an awful lot of reliance on technology to solve these problems. You know, it's kind of like, well, if something's in an end-to-end -to -end encrypted chat, we need to be able to get into it. Um, rather than reflecting upon the fact that, that, you know, maybe there are good reasons to have end-to-end -end encrypted chats. And rather than going, but that's going to knacker the way we do things at the moment, reflect on, well, maybe there are better ways to do it. Filtering has always been a blunt tool, which has good value. But equally, you know, I work with folks like Securus and, and things. Securus have this view that we provide tools to help schools make safeguarding decisions and safeguarding support, we do not provide the solution. I think there is a risk in the safety tech world that um, some people do claim to provide the solution and worse, and if you give us some money, we will implement it for you. So I think, you know, as with everything technology related, the standards evolve, the protocols evolve, the technology evolves, and going, ah, but this might be used in a negative way is, you know, yes, absolutely. Um, but there are ways around that, you know, what, what Apple are talking about in terms of client-side scanning and things acknowledges the fact that maybe end-to-end -end encryption is quite a good thing on the whole. You know, if you look at attempts to put back doors into end-to-end -end encryption in the past, they've generally gone terribly wrong. And, you know, like Vic said in the past, <laughs> it's a bit like saying, oh, can we change the maths? It's like, well, no, you can't change maths. <laughs> Go and talk to a pure mathematician about that sort of thing. But it's almost like that's the low-hanging fruit 
so let's tackle that. And, and the thing I find most irritating and frustrating about this end-to-end -end encryption debate at the moment is we're talking about Facebook Messenger coming into line with all the other platforms. You know that politicians are sat on their WhatsApp groups going, end-to-end -end encryption is terrible, not realizing they're using it every time they send a message. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's, there is a, a requirement to engage in that technical discussion to sort of explain this is what's possible, this isn't what's possible. Putting back doors into encryption makes it not safe for encryption anymore because an algorithm is not very good at going, oh, you, you want to access the back door. Are you a goodie or a baddie? Because there's such cultural relativity around that anyway. Um, you've got some major challenges there. Um, and in terms of uh, Safer Internet Day and how it reaches schools, the UK Safer Internet Centre put up a load of stuff um, and they, they kind of coordinate the whole thing. So saferinternet.org.uk is a very good place to go for that. Um, yeah, so I will I will build on that if I may. Um, and Andrew, I'm going to pick up on some of the language you used, if you don't mind, and that's not to embarrass you specifically. It's a it's to give us a bit of a reset, if we can, um, on the way this particular issue is debated. So you mentioned the harms caused by the technology end to end encryption. And actually, it's not the technology, is it? It's the people doing things to other people and using the technology to send the messages. Now, not for a second is that to say that technology companies don't need to do their bit, but this over-focus on the technology being a source of salvation, if you're safety tech, or technology being the source of harm and damnation, if you're, if you're putting forward end-to-end -end encryption. I, I think it's the wrong conversation because we know that it's a societal issue. We know that um, all the harms that are conducted via online platforms are things that people do to other people. They may be proliferated, they may be amplified um, by technology, but the more that we can pivot to a public health response to issues like child sexual exploitation, where we do you know, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. We raise awareness among people that, um, you know, if they're sharing intimate images non-consensually, that that is a criminal offence, etc. You know, the data protection and privacy considerations around that, then the less we will need in future to keep doing mass level interception and content filtering. We're arguing to keep this because it's what we've been doing, not because it's necessarily the best way to prevent harm to children directly. Um, and so, it, you know, the, 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 the tools that we've been using for uh, that kind of interception and content filtering is just the means by which we detect the harm. There are other ways to detect that harm. They might be more expensive. They might be harder to do at scale. But just because we've been doing it this way until now doesn't mean it always has to be the case. And when I'm looking into the future, actually, text content, files, images are, are going to be less and less relevant because what we're seeing now is that people have online experiences. So you have to be able to kind of put together a large amount of data to be able to identify whether somebody has been abused or not. It's not simply about, um, you know, the sharing or the attempted sharing of an individual known child sexual abuse image, for instance, or another piece of illegal content. So I would like to see us all kind of getting together to think about what next stage harm prevention and incident response looks like, rather than the fixation that we've had in the last 10, 15 years of being able to intercept large amounts of communications, because that ship has sailed, I think, um, from the perspective of end-to-end -end encryption. Thank you, Vic. Um, should we go to the chat or should we go to Edward? Well, go to Edward, because he's had his hand up for a while. Okay. Hi, Edward. Uh, uh... Good day, um, Edward hey. Fidel from uh, BCS Shropshire. Um, it's more of a comment really, uh, to welcome comments, um, which is sort of related. Um, like many branches, um, we organize, uh, you know, lots of events uh, online. And, uh, and we have particular interest um, in trying to encourage uh, the younger generation, um, both as a branch, and also ourselves as a company, um, and we've started apprenticeships and things like that. Um, now, 
you know, one of the things I've been trying to do is in, encourage people to expose them to the great content um, within these talks. Um, and, you know, talking to, um, you know, hungry, ambitious um, teenagers who want to get into the industry, they want to come along to the talks. Now, of course, um, all our talks by default at the moment are actually limited to 16 and over. Um, and um, so that anybody coming into, say, a level three, trying to set themselves up, trying to learn more, they're sort of um, potentially, um, you know, prevented from so doing, which um, is a bit of a shame, really. Um, so I was just wanted to open that up for comments, really, because obviously this this whole limit is around protection and, you know, uh, and all the rest of it. I think it's worth um, a BCS member of staff just coming back on that one quickly before opening it up. Um, so uh, that's definitely a, um, a question that has been raised before. Um, and I think the best that we can do is I think there's definitely a rationale um, for why we should be doing more with with younger people. I think it just has to go. You know, it's a question that we probably haven't raised uh, in the, with the central team before. Um, so there's probably a uh, few things to work out with that, but that sounds like a perfectly sensible sensible thing to do, especially with, with online events and if they're curated in the right way. So um, if it's okay with you, Edward, I'll, I'll take, take that as an, as, a, as, a, as an agenda point and an action point. And I see Arnoldus is there with a pen because <laughs> Arnoldus is way better at keeping me on track than I am. Um, and we'll uh, we'll be able to um, come back with some more information on that because I know that we were just saying how you know the silos within BCS that we want to break down and that's why we've got you know John here who may be able to come back on some of this with with that youth engagement stuff. So I don't know if John's got any thoughts on this. Yeah, well, I was going to say obviously the the age range that you're sort of referencing there with with, um, with barefoot we sort of go up through to um at primary age but then also you've got computing at school that provide um you know a wealth of resources again primarily aimed at the teacher educating the teacher to then pass on that education to the pupils but um you know maybe it's something that we could look at within that the you know uh, interesting topics talks things like this opening it up to actually the, the, potentially the pupil engagement through through the teacher so like yourself dan something i'll note down to consider can I just um, sort of just pitch in a sort of best practice that I mean I'm a safeguarding officer in a, another world if you like so um, but um, the sort of best practices as a staff for 10 we tend to operate which is basically no visuals um, uh, muted um, permissions of guardian um, and um, you know so you know that's a sort of uh, best practice to start with if you like um, but I think I'd really um, welcome um, um, some better guidance on this because, uh, as I say, uh, I think there's, um, you know, um, folks missing out on, you know, things like cyber security. I think it was mentioned earlier on, you know, the, um, um, younger folks aren't getting exposed to good cyber security content. Uh, and knowledge and some of them would just love to um, you know join into some events and um, you know listen to what's going on and learn because uh, it's their you know entry point into uh, apprenticeships and things and it, it really feeds their enthusiasm and that's what we want to be doing as a BCS. Thank you. Well, can I just pick up briefly on on that um, I think Obviously, this session is being recorded, which is why I'm being very careful about what I say about secretaries of state. But um, I think that presents an opportunity. You know, if you can record something, clip it, and then via the BCS provide it, you know, for resources for, for schools. One thing I know from working with a lot of teachers is they are always delighted when they receive resources that they can use to cover certain topics and similar. So, so while the live setting might be challenging for, for various reasons, if you can record it and share it and, and use the central BCS um, teams to, to, to get it into schools, I think, you know, like, as you say, doing a, a, an interesting talk on cybersecurity, then providing young people with access to it could be a fantastic thing to do. 
a ministerial roundtable with um, secondary school kids on online safety would be wonderful, right? Mm. We'll I was actually in a school yesterday uh, and young people were saying how much they valued education and all of them in the room were very clear that one of the biggest problems is they're never listened to. Now, given that I've just gone through the Joint Committee response to the online safety bill where they presented lots of people presenting lots of evidence, opinions, um, uh, one, one group of people that weren't represented at all were young people. Not one single young person was spoken to within either the written or the oral evidence. There were lots of people saying what young people wanted, but no young people themselves. Thank you. Um, while we're on the topic of young people, um, there is a comment from Mohammed Hardiman Barawi in the chat, and he says, what do you think about bad influences slash behavior being promoted on TikTok? Is there any way to filter or such regulation for those involved? Um, I think the, the, the behaviors of, of influences, et cetera, are all challenges for us, but equally, um, we don't have any opportunity for young people to talk about this sort of thing effectively in schools. Now, I actually think primaries generally do a better job of this than, than secondaries. Normally, I say normally because some schools do it extremely well, it's delivered in tutor time by someone who probably doesn't want to deliver it and things. And, and I think better than looking for a technical tool to address that, some form of discussion and mediated debate and allowing young people to express their concerns and providing them with support is, is a far more effective model. Um, however, there doesn't seem to be much appetite for addressing anything other than finger pointing a platform within the legislation at the moment. It's also about responsible media reporting as well, isn't it? And I mean, Andy, you've done a, a considerable work on Momo um, and I've done a certain amount of work on the um, largely fictitious blue whale suicide challenge. Um, and some of you will have heard about the Tide Pod challenge where, you know, reportedly millions of children were eating, uh, you know, washing liquid. Um, which proved not to be the case. And I think we do, as much as we want to protect young people, we do also rather treat them like they're idiots. And that given the chance, they will go and jump off a four story building because they've seen someone do it on Instagram or TikTok. You know, the kids aren't as stupid as all that. Um, but these, what, what we found certainly with, with Blue Whale, and I mean, Andy, you can chip in about Momo, um, was that the media, to a certain extent, brought this phenomenon into, it, phenomenon into being. Um, you know, in Russia, there was a panic around the fact that a number of young people um, had committed suicide um, and links were made between those different cases that wouldn't have otherwise existed. But we now see things like Blue Whale being reported as, you know, historical fact in policy making, in legislation. So our policy and our legislation is to some extent being driven uh, by something that didn't exist and was created by the media. So we need to be wary of this. We need to, you know, as much as possible, this is where I think, you know, BCS, but other organizations as well have a role, is to say, well, hang on a second. You know, is this something that we're panicking about too much, recognizing that we have genuine online safety concerns and that we do we need to do you know genuine engagement to keep uh, young and vulnerable people safe in society um you know we we mustn't be driven by the media sensationalism around this as well yeah just to pick up on that um you know you can go back to stanley cohen and moral panics and things there are certainly things that that engage the media and child abuse is one of them and things that we don't know is another one the Momo thing was amazing because um, we'd been sort of tracking this thing about people injecting upsetting images into Peppa Pig videos for a while. And then all of a sudden, at the end of February in 2019, everyone decides that there's this thing that I think the description was it waits until the parents aren't in the room. Then it appears on the child's device and tells them to self-harm. Complete nonsense. No one. But what happened instead of going, 
well, let's actually dig into this. Everyone just shared it. So Kim Kardashian shared it with her 17 million followers on Instagram. Stacey Solomon did similar. A great deal of safeguarding organizations decided to share about it as well. I know for a fact that in some schools in Cornwall, which is where I live, young people were taken into assembly hall and the head teacher went, now children, there's this thing called Momo and you shouldn't go searching for it. And the week that all happened, there was a 45,000% increase in searches for Momo by young people in schools. So they weren't aware of it until we decided to scare them about it. And I, I have a, a survey that is continually running with young people um, as a result of doing a lot of school visits or working with consultants to do school visits. Young people are still disclosing Momo as something that they've seen online that's upsetting. And no one would have been that aware of it apart from that one week of moral panic where lots and lots of adults, supposedly with good critical thinking skills, decided not to check for evidence, but instead share for, for likes and, and outrage and join in with the collective hysteria. Thank you, um, panel. With that question in mind, following up, um, Philip Verga was asking, should BCS and in brackets CAS um, produce a guide to the accuracy, authority, provenance of more, more of the morass of online safety guidance already available and its suitability for different audiences. Would you like me to reread that question? I know I fumbled a bit. I'm, I'm happy to jump in on all this because oh, Philip I'm happy is a, well. a, a colleague from the IT livery company. So lovely to see you again, Philip. Um, morass of online safety material is a fantastic way of, of referring to this. And if I can draw a line perhaps to the, the online safety bill, um, you know, media literacy is supposed to be part of the online safety bill. I would argue it's been a little bit neglected, certainly in the courage, the coverage of the online safety bill, where the focus has been on holding tech companies to account or bringing in new criminal offences. Um, but I think what's really, really interesting is what we don't see in the online safety bill is a mandating of a government sponsored media literacy program. What we see is that Ofcom is designated as somehow providing some kind of quality control to the stuff that's already out there. And I think that betrays a recognition that there is, you know, there is so much material out there, some of which clearly hasn't been quality controlled with, by any kind of evidence base, at least, but it is you know, largely reliant on um, just telling kids not to do things, which, it, as we know, very rarely works, um, that I would actually like to see more of a role for, whether it's for Ofcom or another independent body, to start quality controlling some of this online safety material. Dare I say also to start quality controlling some of the safety tech that's being put out there. You know, we've seen uh, in the last couple of years, some safety tech companies freely admitting that they were told by their lawyers that they were going to get into trouble um, for data protection infringements for some of the tools that they were already deploying. So definitely we need independent review of the quality of online safety material, of media literacy programs, but also of the technology that's being deployed. Thank you. Yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd very much agree. I, I think... It, it, even in terms of who delivers this stuff, literally the chap who lives next door to me could set himself up as an online safety um, educator tomorrow and go and start delivering in schools as long as he gets a reasonable DPS check. He's a farmer, there's, you know, there's, there's no quality control on it whatsoever. I think within this world, there is a rich um, seam of people apply for funding to develop resources, they de deliver those resources. That's the end of it. There's no evaluation, there's no sustainability. Whatever. So, Yes, absolutely. I would agree wholeheartedly that, you know, an evaluation of what's out there, what's effective, what isn't effective, because again, just reflecting on yesterday, um, the young people I was speaking to said, what's the, war? What's the worst educational uh, approach when someone sits there and fires up a PowerPoint and tells us to read it? What's the best educational approach when we can get to discuss and ask questions and things now? I've rarely been in a school where um, you have uh, uh, a sexual relationship expert, let alone an online expert. It's generally delivered by people with uh, different qualifications who then move into that area. And I think, you know, the, I spend a lot of time in my work talking about the biases we bring to this area because everyone uses the technology, but very few people have received any training in how to look at safeguarding from a, an objective perspective. And I think that's, that's a big challenge. So. That's a long rambling response to yes, absolutely, I agree with what Philip said. Mm. 
Andy, I was just going to pick up on uh, something you said as well about, you know, speaking to to children, young people, pupils and it being so important. I to totally agree. And just from a slightly different perspective, um, to, you know, in what we know that makes good teaching in schools is not just that kind of didactic message and it's understanding what pupils already know or think they know and then nudging them on. And sometimes I think that we've maybe got a way to go in the um, pedagogy, the ways of teaching with online safety, and it's not necessarily ma as mature as other subjects, you know, for, so to really unpick their misconceptions. And just to give an example, you know, I often hear when you're talking to people, do you really know who that person is online? Yes, of course, I know them really well. I've been playing games with them for three years, you know, uh, well, do you actually then it's that it's and it's really unpicking um, what they what they think they they know. So that conversation with pupils in the classroom, informing curricula is just so important to make sure that their, their education in schools around this is effective. No, I can I completely agree. I mean, it was, it was 16 to 18 year olds I was speaking to yesterday and they were constantly talking about the fact that we're just told not to do it. We're just told don't yeah. do that, don't do that. We never get told, you know, the, the, I work with a, a youth worker in Cornwall a lot and she comes from a drugs and alcohol awareness background. And she said, mm -hmm. we gave up on prohibition 20 years ago. You know, it's kind of right, right. If you're going to do this, these are the risks. These are the potential challenges. These are the, the potential positives. You know, mm -hmm. what Vic was saying about public health messaging, but we are still fixated at a policy level, at a national level, right? We need to stop these things from happening. If you look at the classic teen sexting thing, we need to stop kids sexting. Well, good luck with that. You know, um, yeah. what I'd rather see is educational message around if this happens, this is where you can get support. Yeah, so Please about disclose. developing those strategies to assess risk. And, uh, and I'd always remember when um, it was a bit awkward when I was doing a lesson around the, um, you know, speaking to people that you don't know online. And then uh, one of them asked me where I met my wife. <laughs> I said um, she was a stranger online on a dating app that I messaged and started talking to. Uh, so they always chuckle about that. Anyway. <laughs> And, and you know what, Andy, your point about the synergies with cybersecurity is a really good one here, because well, there are lessons that we can learn about how we deal with cyber threats. So, you know, we, we are long past the point where we said we, where anybody promised people absolute security. What we do instead now is we do prevention and awareness and we do incident response. Incident response is a huge part of it. Um, so how we respond to an incident is, is all about you know, the measure of our resilience. What we don't tend to do so well with online safety is say, if you get in a mess, here is what you can do about it. Don't worry, this isn't the worst thing in the world that could happen to you. You can talk to your parents and your family about it or, you know, whoever your trusted adult is people will listen to you people will take it seriously whereas what we do is and and, and you know I've worked for organizations that have done this and I've been directly involved in you know being guilty for this kind of messaging um we scare the hell out of children and we make them feel like it's something that they can't deal with that they can't manage if we could give them the tools to navigate the difficult situations to respond to know who to speak to rather than just you're either not doing it or you've got to go to the police you know that then we've got a generation of children who are going to grow into adults that can navigate risks and conflict and won't need to be saved by technology or their parents every time they get into difficulty that's great. Thank you, Vic. Um, I am conscious of the time. So please, if you have any questions, last couple of questions, stick your hand up, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. And while we wait for that, I just want to go back on something that you said, Vic. You said that the online safety bill neglected um, to mandate a government sponsored media literacy uh, training. And also, I think, Andy, you said earlier that the online safety bill was done in absence of um, consultation with young people and children, right? So my question to you is, if you had a moment to sit down with the Secretary of State for DCMS, um, Nadine Dorries, from a professional perspective, and you were to offer her advice, feedback, or just to say, this is what's missing from the online safety bill, what would you say to her? What solutions would you propose to the current or improvements to the current online safety bill? Um, Andy, shall I let you gather your thoughts for a second? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will be quite I will be quite calm and rational here. Look, one of the things that the online safety bill has done is it has 
not defined what good looks like and not defined what insufficient looks like. So when we're holding tech companies to account, what do we actually want them to do? Um, there, is, there is text in the bill around taking reasonable steps to combat online harms. But because no survey was done of what those companies were actually already doing, it's, um, it's a triumph of rhetoric over evidence. It's, it's saying we're going to hit the, the, the tech companies with a big stick when actually they're already doing a lot of what they're being mandated to do in the legislation. That's not really how I would approach policymaking. I'd do it the other way around. I'd say, right, what are companies already doing? Where's the good practice? What would we then want to develop as a, whether it's mandatory, forced, uh, voluntary code of conduct, and then we can hold them to account. Now, um, you could reasonably argue that it's not been possible to do it that way around because companies haven't been sufficiently transparent about what they do. And transparency is really, really important. And I'm glad to see that that aspect of accountability is built into the online safety bill. But it really is at the moment legislation driven by assumption and the worst of our fears rather than a proper environmental scan of what's actually being done by the industry. We've assumed they're doing nothing. And I can say from first-hand experience, that's absolutely not the case. Well, funnily enough, I agree with what you said there, Vic. Um, in terms of what I would say to, to, to the Secretary of State, sit down with some young people and listen to their concerns. Because when I sit down with young people, they're generally not saying um, we need um, a massive legislative infrastructure where companies can demonstrate intangible duty of care um, they generally say things like we want better education um, and if you look in the online safety bill the 145 pages of it there are two mentions of the word education in the entire thing um, and that's about a media literacy campaign actually Vic apparently Ofcom's going to do it um, but I, I think you know if we are and and oh, I'm not a cynical person, but if if we are to believe that the government are doing this to keep children safe online, maybe we should ask them what their concerns are. Um, because I don't I remember reading one evidence statement in um, the Joint Committee response that said uh, someone said pornography is the number one concern for children. I've never met a teenager that says pornography is my number one concern. They have legitimate concerns around pornography, but they are broad around you know, desensitization and performance anxiety and body image issues and those sorts of things. But when I sit down with a group of young people, I go, what are the issues on, the, on online behaviors that concern you the most? It's about peer on peer abuse. It's about fear of missing out. It's about understanding why that person's pictures got 50 likes and my pictures only got 25 likes. They don't generally all sit there and go, yeah, it's porn. You know, it's, it's we're projecting adultist concerns onto them and telling them they need to listen because we know best and we really don't. Thank you. Um, I am again conscious of time and I haven't seen any new questions. So I'm just going to, sorry, I was just reading the comment. Um, I'm just going to ask the panel maybe just to, Dan, do you want to interject? I did, yeah. I've got I've got a little bee in my bonnet slightly about um the back in the the glory days of of when governments used to do robust equality impact assessments on on uh, on huge pieces of legislation like this, and I haven't actually seen an equality impact assessment on this. I it may may exist, and it may well be great. Um, but uh, having come from a kind of um, equality, diversity, and inclusion background, it's it's something that I think there's huge huge issues around um, disproportionate impacts um, and potential uh, issues with this bill. So I just wondered if off the top of your head you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's something I've been looking into um, doing a piece of work for the European Commission on AI and the rights of the child. Um, and when it comes to child protection, we always assume that the right to protection trumps all of children's other rights. And of course, rights need to be balanced. And there are some cases, I, I, th I think we assume as well, that um, the interests and the rights of the white middle class or upper class child are the rights of everybody and everyone's going to want to ex exercise those rights in exactly the same way. But the example I use is um, if you are a young person who is exploring their sexuality and you think you might be something other than 100% heterosexual and you think your family might not approve of that and they may even get violent with you 
um, you know, if you're not 100% heterosexual, then you have a right to private communications just as much as everybody else. And you may need those private communications even more than the average child that is envisaged, whoever that average child might be, um, when we're thinking about child protection issues. Some people need to be protected from their parents and their caregivers, and it is entirely legitimate for them to have a right to privacy, a right to you know, freedom of information, uh, freedom of expression, etc. All of those rights have to be balanced with child protection. Child protection is not always more important. Funnily enough, Vic, I had exactly that conversation with a group of teenagers from LGBTQ backgrounds. Um, we'd done a, a whole bunch of conversations, and generally speaking, we go all about the dark web, and everyone goes, oh, "That's terrible." And then you go, "Have you ever used it?" No. Well, how do you know it's terrible then? Because we got told it was terrible. And then we were working with this group of young people, and pretty much every single one went, "Yeah, it's brilliant." Said, really? Why is that then? Because uh, my dad's a homophobe, and I need to look at this stuff without thinking that he's monitoring what I'm doing. I know my dad monitors my internet access anyway, a tour browser gives me privacy from that homophobia and, and the abuse that will ensue as a result. So yes, Dan, you're absolutely right. And um, it's extremely neglected. And um, I can remember a politician telling me a while ago that children have no right to privacy when it comes to safety. Um, and that was uh, just, a, just a wonderful point. You go, well, I think we ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989. So. So maybe we should be thinking more progressively than that, but but sadly, it, you know, nuance doesn't fit into this area. It's either, oh, you agree with us or you want children to be harmed. Um, and that's really unhelpful, which is why having technical people explaining what is possible and what isn't possible is a really positive thing to do. I, I saw in the Joint Committee response that Twitter should have been more proactive in anticipating the racist abuse during the Euros. It's like, how? Are they gonna start profiling the, the people and going, Hi there, we've just looked at your posts. We think you might be a racist, so we're going to mute you for the Euros. Is that all right? You know, it's just kind of like, how far does that go before it all goes a bit minority report? 30 seconds if John wants to jump in. Um, I, I was just reflecting as we were summing up there on, um, uh, you know, the important things for me and it, it come, keeps coming back to the to the young person and listening to them um and uh you know to, to really get the kind of nuances of what's important to them what they know and, and how we can build their strategies to navigate what is a very challenging world to navigate safely and, and make the most of so those are my sort of final thoughts Amazing. Thank you. I think that's a really, really good note to end, end on. I would like to first of all thank the panel, Andy Fippen, Victoria Baines and John Chippendall for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from the conversation here and I'm sure our uh, members have as well. So again, really, really grateful for you taking your time to talk to us and help us learn. Um, this has been recorded. It will be uploaded online as soon as we can to, to get it edited and make it look nice for you. Um, if you have any further questions, either for us or for our panelists, maybe you can submit them by via email and we'll forward them. But yes, again, thank you so, so much, all of you for being here. I know you've got work and everything. So thank you for taking the time to be here. And I'm going to end the meeting unless anybody has any last comments. No? Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.